database for inner retinal layer thicknesses using spectralis OCT in Indian population. Um, so I have little financial interest. Um, uh, OCT is, as you know, is a fast non-invasive transpupillary imaging method which produces high resolution cross-sectional images of the retina. So it is used in not just neuro-ophthalmology, also in retina and glaucoma. Uh, it produces high resolution images. The machine that used, which we used was Spectralis uh, SGOCT, which was Hiddelberg uh, machine. Uh, we used the, auto the one with the auto-segmentation software. And uh, um, the test results had excellent repeatability and reproducibility. In our study, we actually um, compared the individual inner, inner retinal layers, which are um, RNFL, GCL, IPL, along with the total retina. Uh, so it's, um, the OCT, OCT uses in neuro-ophthalmology is, as we know, it's used in various conditions like papilla edema, AON, um, uh, compressive optic neuropathies, uh, Alzheimer's. So we know that uh, we follow up the patient, I mean, we analyze um, pericapillary RNFL, macular RNFL, and GCL in various conditions. And it is also useful in uh, um, um, analysis of uh, neurodegenerative diseases. And as well as it's important in glaucoma is increasing with time and more research. Uh, so we need to have a reference database for Indian patients, which I felt was really necessary to, um, 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 to and we, uh, we, need, we should not depend entirely on the global database. Um, so the, it is not just that the foveal dip is seen in all, I mean, in the retina, which should be analyzed in the OCT scan, but we also should look at the thickness and we should compare it with the normal database using a color coding, um, which will help us know the overall health of the retina. Um, so the aim in my study was to reference, I mean, to establish a reference database for these inner retinal layers, and the objective was to do it in um, uh, normal Indian population. The population which I choose was between 18 to 87 years. I had to, I mean, uh, I had to compare it with age. I had to compare it age-wise, sex-wise, and uh, refraction-wise. What was the um, uh, variation that should happen? The relation of uh, the thickness and volumes uh, um, to compare with the axial length, intraocular pressure, central corneal thickness, and to establish a normative database was my objective. So I. Um, this was actually an uh, observational study which was done over a period of 1.5 years. I, uh, the study population was um, people uh, were patients or subjects who are coming in as patients into uh, um, our hospital general OPD for regular eye examination. So all, um, such studies were already done abroad. So this, is, this was my reference thesis which was done on Caucasian population. And uh, based on that, we, took, we made a sample size of 183 and uh, we started our study. So the first one, we, we did it in three steps. First one was recruitment of patients, collection of, uh, second one was collection of data, and third one was compilation of data. So subjects, as I told, were general OPD patients, inclusion criteria, uh, 18 to 87 years, with uh, vi uh, visual equity between, um, uh, uh, visual equity 6, 6, refraction, plus or minus five spherical, plus or minus three cylindrical um, uh, power, um, so the patient underwent normal slit lamp examination, IOP was checked to be normal, normal fundus. We also did a HVF to rule out that the patient did not have glaucoma. Informed consent was taken from the patient. We, the patient excluded when the HVF was abnormal or when the um, uh, patient was found to have any neurodegenerative disease or any old ocular pathology, we excluded those patients. And uh, uh, patients who underwent intraocular surgery except for cataract beyond one year were enrolled in the study. Um, uh, so um, the data collected was all the data, in, uh, apart from the OCT, we also did a scan pachymetry and uh, uh, HVF. And uh, the protocol for OCT that we used was 13 to 25 degree cube with 61 raster lines, 120 micrometer apart, meaning to say the densest scan possible in a Hiddelberg OCT was taken. And the signal strength of more than 20 uh, decibels, only if 20, more than 20, we selected those um, images, the remaining were excluded, and auto-segmentation was used. Any time when the auto-segmentation failed, the patient was again excluded. Um, so the ET, as we know in OCT, we impose an ETDRS circle over that, which are 1, 3, and 6 mm circles um, in front of the retina, and we divide it into central macula, uh, nasal inner, nasal outer, and... Sorry, I think you should bind up. Can you go to yes. the conclusion? 
No, I'll finish it first. Wrap it up, wrap it up. Um, wrap it up. So results, um, we had uh, um, the average thickness and we had descriptive statistics where we found the average Please, inner, Good. outer thicknesses of each layer and it was compiled and uh, the correlation stats, we, we found the correlation, positive and negative correlations which was compiled in um, this uh, in, in tabular column form. So in the discussion, I would like to say that our data were very similar to the previous um, um, uh, previous uh, authors who have done the similar studies. And uh, um, I would like to conclude saying that uh, um, a, a, a similar study with a larger sample number is definitely necessary. Thank you. Thank you very much. Just one uh, question. How do you think macular thickness uh, is important in neuro-ophthalmic conditions? Any conditions uh, sir, um, practically useful? Sir, uh, most of the patients like papilledema and ne optic neuritis on follow-up, we just follow up based on their vision and color vision. Uh, I would like to stress that follow-up of these patients um, using an RNFL and uh, GCL um, thickness from the initial time will help us determine how much, I mean, how much uh, the effectiveness of your treatment during the acute episode. So meaning to say, that if we have a very strong database, an OCT could be an investigation that you would do on a regular basis for an optic neuritis patient to say whether the amount of immunosuppressive therapy that you're giving could be adequate. And this can be, I mean, this itself will be done as a study. Is there any difference between glaucomatous loss and neuroophthalmical loss? Um, yes, ma'am. Uh, we find that. What is? I mean, is there any specific point? Um, um, so, uh, in glaucoma, we see the um, uh, basically the GCL and RNFL gets affected um, in the specific pattern um, following the INST rule. But whereas in neuroophthalmic conditions, um, the the loss is more, um, it's more generalized. So RNFL uh, thickness, you said positive cor correlation is there with age. Was it like that? Yes, ma'am. So how can you explain that with age, more RNFL thickness is there as the age increases? I didn't get your question. Positive correlation means the more the age, yes, the more the, the more RNFL. Yes, ma'am. So how can you explain that? Usually with age, the RNFL thickness should decrease, no? But in our study, we have found that it increases with age, and uh, um, it was just an observational study. So. Okay. okay. So one more study is there in India also, already published, I think. Yes. Have, you, have you seen it? Yes, ma'am. Yes. Okay. How is it different from your study? Ma'am, um, um, so uh, they have um, done uh, GCC complex, and uh, I have done individual uh, RNFL uh, thicknesses of SDOCT, ma'am. Okay. Thank you. Next, Dr. Disha Agarwal. Uh, I would like to request Dr. Shusha Shugathan to be ready to be the next speaker. And in all, I'll be presenting on clinical spectrum and recovery patterns in patients with acquired isolated ocular motor nerve palsies Uh, as we all know, we need an intact motor and sensory system for a perfect binocular singular single vision. In the motor system, the third, fourth and sixth cranial nerves play the important role by supplying the various extraocular muscles for a perfect coordination. Lesions in any of these nerves or their pathway causes what is known as paralytic strabismus. Various etiologies have been identified in, uh, for the same uh, in various study populations. Among the, in the most extensive report from the Mayo Clinic that included 4,278 cases over 30 years, sixth nerve palsy and idiopathic cause was identified as the most common. However, different studies have found different uh, results be because of the different study population included. Also, the time taken to recover and the degree of recovery depends on the nerve involved and the etiology. We need, uh, we need to know what is the most common etiology and the nerve involved in our study population as ocular motor nerve palsy is a very common entity presenting in ocular uh, uh, emergency. 
so the aim of our study was to determine the different etiologies and recovery patterns in the patients with acquired isolated omnps and the association between them in our study population uh, the study was a prospective observational single centered study done from july 2021 to june 2023 at jipmer pondicherry consecutive sampling was done after approval from institutional ethics committee we included all patients above 5 years of age with acquired isolated omnps and excluded patients with congenital omnps combined omnps terminally ill patients patients who were previously diagnosed with strabismus patients uh, with known restrictive disorders and patients who had visual acuity less than 660 for, for which diplopia charting and hess charting could not be done after co after collecting the demographic data and detailed ocular and systemic history we did standardized eye examination and detailed squid evaluation which included ocular motility assessment diplopia charting and hess charting and quantifi quantification using the pbct and modified or modified Krims krimsky test uh, dosage measurement and pupillary examination was done and baseline rbs and bp was checked for all the patients neuroimaging was done wherever indicated etiologies were classified on the basis of ischemic compressive traumatic iatrogenic and idiopathic and recovery patterns were classified as complete recovery partial recovery some recovery and no recovery this is the clinical picture of one of our patients with right sixth nerve palsy uh, which was of ischemic uh, etiology we can see restriction in lateral gazes uh, and diplopia ch uh, diplopia charting for a patient with right sixth nerve palsy and hess charting this is the clinical picture of a patient with left sided third nerve palsy and uh, hess charting for uh, has charting for a patient with traumatic left third nerve palsy and diplopia charting for patient with sixth uh, fourth nerve palsy statistical analysis was done using ibm spss version 19 categorical variables were represented as frequency and percentages and continuous variables as median kruskal valis test and fisher's exact test were used for analysis coming to the results we included total 80 number of patients out of which the maximum wear of the sixth nerve palsy group that is 68.8 percent patients median age was 47 years we had an equal representation of both female and male gender and we had more of unilateral patients etiology coming to the etiologies there were more of ischemic patients in our study population that is 35 percent closely followed by idiopathic traumatic compressive and iatrogenic which was only one case that was of third nerve palsy Uh, among the various etiologies in the, uh, various nerve palsy groups sixth nerve palsy had maximum ischemic palsy uh, patients and third nerve had more maximum traumatic cases fourth nerve had uh, both ischemic and traumatic equal number cases uh, among the third nerve palsy patients maximum patients were having pupil involving palsies that was 61.1% uh, all the ischemic cases had pupil sparing palsies all iatrogenic and compressive cases had pupil involving palsies this difference was statistically significant uh, at the end of month 3 we had 53.8% patients with complete recovery out of which maximum belonged to the sixth nerve group that is 69.1% patients this this difference was again statistically significant similarly at the end of month 6 we had 86.3 patients with complete recovery out of which 94.5 patients uh, belong to the sixth nerve group again this was statistically significant dividing the recovery pattern on the basis of etiology maximum recovery was shown by ischemic palsy uh, patients that was 39.1% patients this was again statistically significant it is important to note that we had no patients with no recovery by the end of month 3 which which uh, tells us that acquired isolated omnps had very good prognosis conclusion uh, so our study uh, Uh, showed that the most common acquired omnp was sixth nerve palsy least common fourth nerve most common cause was ischemic and earliest to recover was sixth nerve palsy and palsies of ischemic etiology so very nice study uh, how do you differentiate between some uh, recovery and partial recovery so ma'am we decided the criteria that uh, if a patient is having uh, 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 the partial recovery was defined as having some residual strabismus, which will be of prism diopter less than ten prism diopters, and complete recovery will be zero prism diopters. So anything between that will be some recovery. I didn't. Uh, sorry, I didn't get it. So, could you repeat that again? Uh, so, uh, sir, complete recovery will be the patients who have no diplopia mm -hmm. at the end of like month. Uh, the follow-ups were done at month three and month six. So, complete recovery will be there should be no diplopia and uh, there uh, the, there should be no deviation on PBCT as well. Uh, 
partial recovery was uh, that the P uh, PVCT at the end of my, the, at the follow up visit should be less than 10 prism diopters. So anything between le uh, 10 prism diopter and the baseline prism diopter was considered as some recovery. Thank you. Thank you. This is basically not a study, it's more of uh, case presentations. For lack of time, I have three cases, but I, I will at least like to present one. Uh, so uh, the first case uh, is about a 28-year-old uh, woman who came to uh, the refractive OPD uh, for uh, blurring of vision. And uh, she was uh, taken up for a refractive lens exchange surgery. Uh, she had minus 19 in one eye and minus 20 in the other eye. Uh, she was uh, operated with a multifocal lens in each eye and the surgeon had recorded a BCV of 6 by 6 and 6. Uh, she was treated with tear substitutes, checked for aberrations, glare and contrast because post-surgery she said my vision has become lesser. What do we do next? So the patient just wandered off into my OPD and what we did next was we just lend a patient a year to the patient's complaints when a patient who is 6 6 N6 is uh, saying that they, she cannot say well and especially after the surgery has vision has deteriorated we went back listened to her complaints and she said first I couldn't see with the left eye then even my right eye became blurry I started bumping into objects and uh, my uh, near reading became very poor um, so, uh, although she was not on any regular medications for any systemic ailment, she had frequent headaches and her menstrual cycles have d had been irregular since the past 8 to 10 months. So I re-examined with a fresh outlook, uh, went across from as, uh, big, uh, as basic as, uh, you know, an abnormal head posture to uh, uh, visual acuity and uh, I found out that after line number uh, 6 by 18, she was reading less for the, all the letters that were uh, coming on the uh, first few uh, letters on the left side. Um, I also uh, uh, found out that she could read only one digit out of the double digits on an LED uh, color vision uh, uh, map, uh, Ishihara. A confrontation test was done and it was revealed that she had bitemporal hemianopia. The pupil reaction was normal and the slit lamp confirmed a quite pseudophagic eye with a well-centered uh, you know, posterior multifocal lens. This was how her fundus looked like. So she had a myopic fundus. Uh, pallor was not that visible because of the tilted disc in the left eye, if you note. But then we went ahead and did a perimetry. The perimetry 30-2 was quite depressed, so we did a 10-2, and this is the picture that we came across. An urgent MRI brain was done with special attention to the cella and pituitary gland, and a well-circumscribed CSF signal intensity. Cystic lesion was found in the cellar and supercellar region. It was not very invasive, so we were ruling out craniopharyngioma and sticking more to the Rathke cyst. She was referred to a neurosurgeon who performed a uh, cyst drainage through an endoscopic transphenoidal surgery and three weeks post-surgery there was a marked improvement in the symptoms and the fields as you can see. Quickly rushing to case two, there were two cases of acute intermittent esotropia in a child. First case, I'm sorry, I don't have the pictures. Both of them presented very similarly with this kind of uh, uh, an esotropia around 15 uh, degrees. Uh, in the first uh, case, uh, the BCV was 6 by 6, stereopsis was present, and even though they said that the, they were, the father was noticing a squint, when he came to me the first visit, he didn't have a squint. It was on the second uh, visit that I discovered that he has a 15 degree esotropia. Whereas the other uh, child, who was a girl, uh, she had an alternate esotropia with left eye dominance, 40 prism diopter, esotropia for distance, and 30 prism diopter for near. Stereopsis was absent. Uh, in this girl, whereas stereopsis was present for the first child. General physical examination was normal in both. So in the first scenario, accommodation and convergence was unaffected, but fatigue test was positive, ice pack test was inconclusive, a pediatric neurologist op opinion was sought, CT chest was normal, there was no thymoma, uh, but the um, acetylcholine receptor antibody was weakly positive with an anti mus negative. RNS uh, and uh, single fiber EMG was advised, which showed a decremental response more than 10%. He was diagnosed as juvenile myasthenia, started on peridostegmin, and uh, with the usual dose of 1 milligram per kg per day, uh, he was better in four months and has been on a close follow up since. This is the second scenario wherein uh, the MRI re revealed that she had actually an Arnold Chiari type 1 malformation. Her earlier photographs did not show any squint at all and it was true that this squint was lasting. It was not uh, you know, changing, uh, having any diurnal variation as such. 
and the management was that she was referred to a neurosurgeon and the neurosurgeon advised nil surgical intervention. Though she underwent a strabismus surgery, 4.5 millimeter medial rectus resection and six millimeter lateral rectus resection, um, after which she has been orthotropic. So I will skip the last case for paucity of time and uh, go back to the points of discussion. Go back to your basics, give due importance to uh, you know, the undilated uh, examination pay heed to subtle signs, not all disc edemas are going to be uh, uh, needing steroids, not all disc pallors are uh, nutritional, amblyopia is a diagnosis of uh, exclusion, intermittent symptoms without any signs, please be cautious before shunning them away and be thorough before a surgical intervention, see a patient as a whole, do not ignore the systemic history, maintain medical records and refer when in doubt, please, thank you. What uh, method uh, was used to, sorry, this is not neuro, uh, what method was used to test the stereopsis? The stereopsis, basically what we did was a TNO uh, was used. Okay. A TNO test was used. First, the basic titmus itself was absent for uh, the girl, whereas the boy could uh, read up to 40 seconds of okay. answer. I was interested because uh, for distance, the child was having suppression, but for near, the child was having stereopsis. So, I mean, it could happen. I, but yeah, uh, yeah. It was, and, and like I said, for the first case, it was because it was a myasthenia, he was on and off, so stereopsis was good. So actually, stereopsis may be good, but in that case, for distance, suppression occurring is uh, somewhat doubtful because it is an intermittent thing. Uh, it, it was intermittent, but diplopia. if you know, myasthenia is not going to be like a committent squint. It is going to be more like an incommitant yes, squint. So when he was looking for distance, probably he was just focusing with okay. my mouth. Yes. What I mean to say is, if we actually look as, as the child properly, they'll be actually seeing the image on the other side. On the other uh, side. That is what I'm saying. Yes. Thank you. So that scenario two, uh, do, you, do you think that Arnold Shari malformation was related to the squint? Uh, it was a sudden onset and we couldn't find any other uh, thing. And she actually, after the surgery also, she was on continuous follow-up because uh, she didn't have any systemic signs. The neurologist thought that it is better to follow up. and. Uh, uh, Surprisingly, it's been, I think, almost uh, eight and a half years now, and she it, it does not come back. So we are just thinking maybe as she grew, maybe uh, that was the reason. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, just one minute, please. What is the onset of sim symptom uh, in the first case after the surgery? I mean, what is the gap? Uh, or it was before the symptom? The first case. It was immediate, ma'am. It was very immediate. Uh, after the surgery. After the surgery. So, I mean, I don't know if uh, scientifically we could find a reason, but what I feel is because she was minus 19 and minus 20 and wearing spectacles, she had always ignored her peripheral vision. And as soon as the specs went off and the lens came in, I think she became more conscious about the, you know, deficiency of the field and the contrast uh, issues that she was having. Because it was immediately after surgery, she was very, uh, she was, uh, uh, you know, a divorcee with a child who had taken 80,000 loan from her employee for the getting this multifocals done. And he, she was very upset that post-surgery, whatever vision she had, even that had gone. So it was very immediate. Maybe it was an accident. Thank you. Yeah, I think it's the vision, I mean, is it? Immediately after the surgery, how can we see the symptom? I mean, I would like to request Dr. Arpita Sthapak. Is she present? Okay. Uh, next, I would like to request Dr. Manisha Kumari. Uh, Dr. Ankita Singh is present here. Okay. You will be the next speaker. Please be ready. Good morning, everyone. I am presenting on etiologic components and prognostic determinants of acquired sixth cranial nerve palsy. Introduction. Cranial nerve six palsy has been reported to be the most common ocular motor nerve palsy 
It has vascular or ischemic and idiopathic etiologies. However, acute cranial nerve palsy may be an early sign of serious intracranial lesion, warranting careful assessment, including neuroimaging. The recovery rate of cranial nerve 6 palsy is about 60 to 80 percent, and overall, its recovery rate is good compared to other oculomotor nerve palsies. In clinical practice, 6 nerve palsy is more frequently diagnosed in younger patients than before. Therefore, careful medical history taking and clinical evaluation are as important as imaging in 6 nerve palsy. Aim to determine etiology of 6 nerve cranial nerve palsy and its effects on prognosis. Material and methods, hospital-based prospective study, 52 patients who presented with acquired abducens nerve palsy at a tertiary care center between April 2022 and March 2023 were recruited in the study. History of present illness, trauma, systemic disease were noted. Relevant blood investigations and MRI was done. They were followed up for three months. Etiology and rate of recovery was noted. Total number of patients were 52, 28 males, 24 females. 41, that is 79% recovered and 11, that is 21% did not recover in three months. Rate of recovery was 79%. Mean, mean duration of recovery was 70 days, that is 10 weeks. Etiology was, uh, commonest was vascular in 46%, idiopathic in 21%, followed by trauma in 17%, neoplasm in 12%, and other causes constituted 4%. Among the non-recovering cases, mostly were because of neoplasm in 46%, then trauma 27%, 18% because of idio uh, vascular cause, 9% idiopathic. This is the pie chart showing etiology of 6 cranial nerve palsy and the bar diagram which is showing the etiology among non-recovering cases among which neoplasm was the commonest. Elder et al. have reported that microvascular disease is the most frequent cause of acquired 6 nerve palsy in patients over 50 years of age. Park et al., Jung et al., and Peter et al. have reported that 28 to 56% of patients with 6 nerve palsy have a vascular cause and 24 to 27% of them have an unknown origin. In our study, vascular cause contributed to 46% cases of 6 nerve palsy similar to previous studies. Sanders et al. reported that 51 of 59 patients, that is 86%, experienced resolution of 6 nerve palsy and only three patients required strabismus surgery. In this study, rate of recovery was 79%. Jung et al. reported that recovery period was seven weeks in isolated ischemic 6 nerve palsy. In this study, period of recovery was found to be 10 weeks. So conclusion, most common cause of 6 cranial nerve palsy was vascular, followed by idiopathic, trauma, neoplasm, and other causes. Prognosis was best for idiopathic and worst for neoplastic cause. These are all references. Thank you. What was the age range of the patients? Mean age was 47 years. And uh, how long did you follow these patients up? Ma'am, for three months. Okay. So you said average uh, duration of uh, recovery was 10 weeks. Yes, yes, ma'am. What was the range? There must be a range also, no? Oh, yes, ma'am. It was 7 to si 10 weeks. Thank you for uh, finishing well ahead of time. I have one question. Uh, how? how how do you differentiate, uh, means how do you segregate between the vascular causes and the idiopathic? Like most commonly we see the diabetic patients developing like six nerve palsy. So do they fall under, uh, in your case, do they fall under the vascular or idiopathic? We, because most of the time we don't get anything in imaging or some, anything like in that. In our case, we have included them in vascular causes. Okay. So uh, then uh, how will you classify as idiopathic? don't get if anything if there is no systemic association and no uh, neurological findings and no significant history then okay so if the patient doesn't have uh, diabetes hypertension or dyslipidemia then uh, other any other vascular causes then it is idiopathic right yes okay
Okay, next I would like to invite Dr. Ankita Singh. Uh, is Dr. Sabarinath A present here? Okay, you'll be the next speaker. Please be ready. Huh? Good morning, everyone. I'll be presenting a case of herpes zoster optic neuritis. Herpes zoster ophthalmicus, it is a viral infection of the, tri of the virus cell vi viruses caused by the reactivation and affecting the trigeminal nerve. The appearance of the vesicular rashes, normally they precede the eye manifestations and the eye lesions are seen in almost 17% of the cases. And the ocular manifestation commonly seen are keratouveitis. They could be uh, secondary glaucoma, retinal necrosis, vasculitis or optic neuritis. Optic neuritis is one of the rare complication of herpes zoster and as per the reports, uh, it is seen in 0.4% of the cases. So here's this uh, serving soldier, 33 years old. Uh, he was a immuno immunocomp uh, uh, immunocompetent patient with no known comorbidities. He presented with a sudden onset visual loss in his right eye since 10 days, uh, which was not associated with a pain, redness, discharge, flashes of floaters. There was no history of any trauma. There was no history of any surgery or any complications. In the, uh, and the similar complaints in the family. And there was no such episodes in the past. Two weeks uh, prior to the presentation, patient had developed a pain and the tingling sensation over the right scalp, forehead, and eyelid. And it was followed by the vesicular eruptions over the same area. Patient was diagnosed, diagnosed as a case of the herpes zoster and was started on oral acyclovir, 800 milligrams, five times a day for 10 days. On the seventh day of the medication itself, the patient developed sudden onset of the vision in his red, uh, right eye. On evaluation, the patient had uncorrected visual acuity of the 636, which uh, offered, uh, which accepted uh, no further corrections. And the uh, left eye was normal. The IOP was also normal. The RAPD grade two was seen in the right eye. The ocular movements were full and free in all the gazes. And it was orthophoria on the cover test. NTA segments were essentially normal in both the eyes. This was the clinical appearance at the initial presentations where the hyperpigmented macules and patches were seen over the right of thalmic branch of the trigeminal region and subsequently followed up after two weeks of initial presentation. Color vision was reduced perception in the right eye and the fundus evaluation showed a healthy disc in both the eyes. On MRI, uh, brain in orbit with contrast, there was a thickened right orbital nerve with uh, patchy heterogeneous hyperintensity signal seen in the right optic nerve. OCT, macula, and RNFL were within normal limits. The visual field 30-2 uh, and the neurological fields, they showed inferotemporal field effects. NTA uh, visual, uh, VEP showed NTA visual pathway defect with increased P100 latency on the right side. The other investigations, including the blood sugar, CBC, SR, other inflammatory markers and serological tests and Montux were normal, were negative. On the basis of the history, clinical examinations and the investigations, a diagnosis of atypical optic neuritis right eye was made and the patient was started on oral prednisolone, one milligram per kg body weight, along with IVA, cyclovir, 500 milligrams, three times a day for 15 days. And after the completion of the treatment, the vision improved in the right eye to six by nine. Uh, however, the RAPD still persisted. Color vision returned to the normal. Fundus evaluation, this was uh, taken after the two months of the treatment. They showed pallor in the mild uh, temporal pallor in the right eye. Visual field, on visual field evaluation, there was a persistent inferotemporal defect in the right eye. The limitation of this case was CSF analysis could not be done to rule out the infection as the patient was not very willing. Apart from that, there was no other signs and symptoms to support any other diagnosis. Herpes is uh, zoster infection is a result of reactivation of the varicella virus, and optic neuritis is a very rare complication occurring in only 0.4%. The mechanism of optic neuritis is uh, rarely known. However, the proposed mechanisms have been, it's a direct inv uh, invasion of the virus from, to the optic nerves to the cavernous sinus. It could be the local extension causing the damage to the optic nerve or the ischemia of posterior ciliary vessels which had caught the inflammation of the nerves. The diagnosis poses uh, significant challenges, but the close temporal association of the optic neuropathy after the onset of cutaneous zoster virus gives a clue. Other brain uh, MRI and inflammatory markers are a significant tests to rule out the diagnosis. Treatment, the mainstay remains the steroids along with under the cover of IV acyclovir. However, the randomized controlled trial and prospective studies are still not done. 
and the fact that the ocular symptoms are caused both by the active replication of the virus itself with the concurrent inflammation supports the treatment regimen here. These are the previous studies which have supported the same uh, treatment regimen. To conclude, RAPD prompts the urgent investigation and management for the better visual economy under the uh, condition when herpes zoster is already present. And in a patient with optic neuritis here, we recommend the use of corticosteroids with uh, acyclovir for the uh, better visual recovery. These are my references. Thank you. So for how long was the steroids given? Ma'am, for 15 days. 15 days, ma'am, oral steroids were given. Just same dose without Yes, ma'am, same dose, ma'am. So many case reports are there about this. So how is your case report different from those case reports? Uh, sorry, ma'am. Many case reports are already there in literature of yes, this complication. So yes. how is your case report different? Hmm. Mama, actually, this was a serving soldier who, was, uh, who had no other comorbidity, and he was uh, deployed in a very high altitude, stressful area. So probably this might be one of the stressor for the re uh, reduced uh, immunity in his case. So that is why this patient came in the light. And he had no other symptomatology at the time of the presentation, ma'am. So you can add this to your paper, no? Yes, ma'am. We have added this, actually. Okay. Okay. Was uh, VEP, visually evoked potentials, done? Yes, sir. Okay. And that should be 100 latency, sir. Right. Okay. Uh, patient's visual field is typical of optic neuritis, do you think no, so? No, ma'am, it was not typical of optic neuritis. It was more towards uh, uh, glaucomatis, but however, the other field, uh, the other eye was normal. There wasn't any this thing, and precisely the Anderson criteria were not fulfilled in this case, ma'am. So, and along with the MRI findings and VEP, we were, uh, we made the diagnosis more towards the neurological What do you mean by Anderson criteria is not fulfilled? Ma'am, in this case, the... Uh, Normally in the two consecutive Anderson criteria, two uh, 30 dash fields, uh, glaucomatous hemi fields are abnormal, then the uh, non-edged points. Uh, that is the earliest, it's a very, uh, I mean, advanced visual field defect. In the yes, earliest case in Anderson, what you are describing is the earliest stage of Anderson criteria. Ma'am, but... Uh, and the CD ratio is definitely in the both eyes, the asymmetry is there. Yes, ma'am. Next, Dr. Sabarinath. Uh, Dr. A. Balaraj is present here. Okay, so he'll be the next speaker. Please be ready. Uh, good morning, everyone. Myself, Dr. Sabarinath, MS resident from Aravind Eye Care System, Madurai. Today, I'm going to discuss about visual outcome in patients treated with corticosteroids for indirect traumatic optic neuropathy. Traumatic optic neuropathy is uncommon but potentially sight threatening condition resulting from either ocular or head trauma. The incident ranges between 0.7 to 2.5 percentage. It can be classified as direct type when there is a direct injury to the nerve in form of avulsion or laceration. Indirect type when there is an impact to the forehead resulting in a shearing force and stress wave which propagates towards the intracanalicular portion which can either result in axonal injury, disruption of blood supply or intraneural edema. The aim of our study is to compare the baseline visual acuity with final visual outcome in patients treated with high-dose corticosteroids and to determine the predictors of final visual outcome. It is a retrospective study conducted for a period of six months at Department of Neuro-Ophthalmology, Aravind Eye Care System, Madurai. 51 patients were included in this study based on sudden loss of vision with RAPD following trauma in the absence of other causes of vision loss. Those who had a contraindication for steroids, those who had a direct injury to the nerve, those patients with decreased vision due to other causes of trauma like corneal tear, hyphema, subluxator or dis dislocated lens and retinal detachment were excluded from this study. Coming to the results, 96% of our patients were male, 3.9 were female, the, their mean age of presentation was 33.92. The most common mode of trauma was RTA which was 78.4% followed by fall followed by an assault. All our patients were traveling in two-wheeler, less than one percentage were wearing helmet, nine of them were under the influence of alcohol. All our patients had unilateral in, uh, involvement with 100 percentage of them had RAPD. Based on time of presentation, 33 per percentage of our patients presented within 72 hours of trauma, 21 percentage presented between 72 hours to one week. 64 percentage of our patients had co color vision defective, uh, tw in 27 percentage of patients we can't able to assess the color vision. Based on uh, visual acuity at the time of presentation, 23 percentage of patients had no light perception, 41 percentage had between light perception to 3 by 60. Uh, 31 patients had uh, or orbital wall fractures, of which lateral wall being most common. 
60 percentage of our patient had craniofacial fractures, 25 percentage had intracranial injuries. Coming to dis discussion, those who presented within two weeks to our center following trauma was treated with IV methyl prednisolone, one gram uh, for three days, followed by oral methyl uh, prednisolone, one milligram per kg body weight on tapering dose for five to six weeks. Those who presented after two weeks were treated with multivitamins. We compared the visual outcome in steroid treated group by dividing them into three groups. Those who presented within 72 hours were uh, classified into group one. Between 72 hours to one week were between in, in group two and one to two weeks, two, two weeks were group three. And we found that those who presented within 72 hours and between 72 hours to one week had vis better visual outcome at follow-up visit which was found to be statistically significant. We also evaluated the factors which influences the final visual outcome. We termed them as a good visual outcome if there is more than 15 letters improvement from the baseline. And we found that out of 29 patients, only five patients who presented with blindness had better visual outcome at follow-up visits. Out of 18 patients with LOC, only one patient had better visual outcome. And none of the patients with zygomatic or maxillary complex fra fractures had better visual outcome. To conclude, visual outcome was better in patients who presented within one week of trauma and treated with high-dose corticosteroids. Mild to moderate visual impairment at the time of presentation had good prognosis. Those who presented with severe visual impairment to blindness and those with LOC, orbital and craniofacial fractures had poorer visual outcomes. These are all my references. Thank you. So how many of these no PL patients got some vision? No, ma'am. Only one patient improved to hand movements, ma'am. Rest of them stayed uh, no light perception only, ma'am. So steroid was given uh, uh, within two uh, patients who uh, within two weeks, right? Yes, sir. Who presented within two weeks? Yes, sir. After that, no steroid. No, sir. Okay. So this uh, international optic nerve uh, trauma study is there. Okay. Sir. How is your study different from that? Ma'am, uh, they were saying uh, either if you treat with steroids or uh, uh, optic nerve decompression, there is no, not much of uh, improvement. But in our study, we found that majority of our patients presented within one week, ma'am. Presented within one week and treated with IV methyl prednisone, they have some uh, visual improvement, ma'am. Uh, particularly those who had a mild and uh, uh, moderate visual impairment at the time of presentation, they had a significant visual improvement, ma'am. What multivitamins were given? Any specific combination or? So we gave methyl, uh, methyl cobalamin. Mainly? Yes. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Dr. Deepak Patel is here. Okay, please be ready. You will be the next speaker. Start, sir. Yes. Uh, good morning, judges. So my brief paper is on proficiency assessment of trained vision center technician in neuro-ophthalmological disease screening. As we know, telemedicine enables the remote access to the specialized neuroscientific care. And vision center technicians play a pivotal role in early detection and referral processes in rural areas. And plays a key role in diagnosing the vision and life-threatening diseases and collaborating with the base hospital for the improved patient outcome. The main purpose of this study is to evaluate the overall agreement uh, made between uh, trained vision center technician and neuro-ophthalmologist specialists. The objectives were to compare the diagnostic accuracy and to investigate the factors contributing to any discrepancies. Uh, this is a geographic map showing the study location of 17 vision center. The average distance from the base hospital uh, is around 50 kilometers. So how essential are vision center in identifying the neuro-ophthalmological visit? A patient enters the uh, vision center and uh, a patient is registered and the relevant clinical history uh, and anterior segment examination is made with slit lamp and uh, posterior segment examination is made by non-midriatic fundus photography and the relevant details were communicated to the base hospital to a junior resident and the referral process is initiated. So the study design is a retrospective uh, hospital-based study of one year duration and the relevant details are collected from the EMR record. So out of 554 referral, 331 visited the neuro-ophthalmology clinic and the mean age was 45 years and the most common complaint was defective vision followed by double vision, drooping of lids, field defect, headache and eye pain. The majority of them were females contributing about 56 percentage and most rarely distributed in the uh, middle age group. The average time to reach the base hospital, 59% uh, uh, reached the base hospital less than three days. And are they truly a neuro-ophthalmological diseases? Yes, 
the 70 percent were confirmed to have neuro ophthalmologic diseases the pathologists were categorized into afferent pathway disorder and efferent pathway disorder so among the false referral pseudo papillodema was the most common cause uh, about nine percentage among the afferent uh, disorder nutritional optic paler was the most common about 77 percentage and uh, Craninov palsies were found to be more number in the efferent disorder contributing to eight percentage among the vision threatening diseases ischemic optic neuropathy found in a uh, large number and in the life threatening diseases intracranial space occupying lesion are found in large number about seven patients uh, cva from a vision center yes we found around five patients referred from a vision center in a one year period uh, three had homonymous hemianopia and two had cortical blindness uh, among the craninov palsy six and seventh now were found to be more common the overall uh, agreement in the neuro ophthalmological uh, disease diagnosis made by vision center technician is 66 percentage and for afferent disorder is 66 percentage out of 297 cases and 67 percentage out of uh, 36 cases uh, there is a uh, excellent agreement in lid and uh, a fair agreement in pupil abnormalities and good agreement in extraocular movement and uh, disc abnormalities and the most of the studies the average wa age was meaning from 45 to 56 and females were more common the most common a query was a vision and visual field disturbance and the most average time to reach is less than three days and uh, comparing the recent studies Conway et al and Delay et al had excellent agreement and Timothy et al and our study had good agreement in diagnosing the neuro ophthalmological diseases and clinical findings to coming to discussion to interpret optic disc photograph may be challenging 61 percent disc abnormalities agreement was met in our study uh, Conway et al emphasized there is a need for enhancement in technology and in our study, uh, we matched visual fields perfectly for all case, uh, exceeding the uh, consistency reported by Felix Ektal. So hereby recommend the policy makers to integrate tele ophthalmology into stroke system for improved uh, patient outcome. Uh, Concluding, there was good agreement between the findings of VC technician and neuro-ophthalmologist, and trained technician can help in early detection and referral to the higher center, and it will uh, help patients in the remote places, especially rural areas, to assess the high quality cost effective neuro ophthalmic care and these are my recommendation for tele neuro ophthalmic care color vision uh, hd fundus photo central field visual field examination by germ screen uh, best character visual acuity swinging flash light test and regular cme to update about the neuro ophthalmological disease screen i hereby thank aos scientific committee for giving me this opportunity uh, to present here these are my references thank you why are you recommending for Jerem screen? Uh, for visual field uh, testing, ma'am. Yeah, but why you are not recommending for uh, Humphrey or other things? No, for cost effective, ma'am. This, this study is where, uh, with one vision center or with many vision Sa centers? 17 vision centers. Sir. Okay, so was, was the uh, training and the capability of all the vision technicians equal? Uh, yes, sir. Or so the vision center technician will have a uh, two-year extensive training in the base hospital. Uh, okay. So out of how many patients seen, you said 544 were referred. Out of how many patients, 544 referrals were required? Uh, 331, so 60 percentage were uh, No, no, what I'm asking is, out of total how many patients, 554 neuro referrals? Like what is the total number of, what is the approximate total number of outpatients all these tele vision centers would have seen together? That is what I'm asking. You ha don't have the data. It's okay. Why so I'm asking is this? they see around uh, uh, 50 patients per day in a single vision okay. center. So why I'm asking is how far are neuro ophthalmic illnesses a public health issue to be tackled at a community level? So that is my. But all these patients underwent Jerem also. Ah, Jerem yes screening sir, yes also. Sir. Yes, sir. Color all vision, Jerem. Whoever had a the, the vision technician had a doubt that they may have a neuro problem, they will do a Jerem also. Yes, sir. Yes. Okay. Uh, how many of them are referred for the imaging, the CT or MRI? Uh, so and how uh, they were, I mean, it was decided? No, after uh, they're coming to the base hospital, uh, the anterior segment and posterior segment examination done, RAPD and the uh, fundus examination, then the neuro ophthalmologist will decide whether neuro imaging is needed for this patient uh, or not. So very well timed. So seven... Uh, so in the life-threatening diseases, uh, intracranial space occupying lesions were found uh, seven in number, and uh, uh, 
uh, particle vein thrombosis uh, about two in number were identified. Uh, so like that, uh, uh, data. Very good study, very well time presentation also. So in all the vision uh, centers, uh, germ screen was there, you're yes, saying? Yes, sir. So the diagnosis was made by the VC technician or that junior resident on the phone call? No, the, uh, the reference process is initiated. Uh, the so who made the diagnosis? Huh? The VC or that doctor? The both will make, sir. Both will make. So, so the VC technician will tell the finding. Uh, so if it is, uh, uh, they will agree on term and uh, they refer. Okay, so like you said, Ixol was one of the diagnoses. So, so how did they make? So sixty-six percent agreement were made when comparing with the urophthalmology specialist. Okay, so you said Ixol was one of the diagnoses. So how did they make that diagnosis without an imaging at that time? You said intracranial space occupying lesion is one of the diagnoses. So without any imaging at the VC, how did they make that diagnosis then? Uh, so they will be referred as a papilledema. Uh, okay, okay. So maybe you can change that in your study. Right. Yeah. The final diagnosis side. Oh. Dr. Deepak Patel. Uh, next, I would like to request Dr. Devika Bhattacharya Mandlik uh, to be ready. Good morning, everyone. I am here presenting a case on bilateral optic swelling with persistent visual loss in anemia. There is no any financial interest. It's never easy to diagnose the cause of painless bilateral optic swelling because of its extensive causes. Among these, the most likely etiological categories are increased intracranial pressure, infectious inflammatory, demyelinating, toxic metabolic, and malignant hypertension. Here in this case report, considering the clinical characteristics, all the differential diagnosis ruled out, sticking the diagnosis to intracranial hypertension and bilateral non arteritic anterior ischemic optic neuropathy. After proper workup, it was found out that here anemia is responsible for bilateral optic disc swelling. The case report is a 56-year-old man with medical history of recurrent gastric ulcer was admitted and had complaint of acute painless vision loss in the left eye, left and right eye for five and three days respectively. Prior, he had experienced a solitary episode of melena on the same day. Physical examination showed pale skins, normal hydration and normal heart tones. Blood pressure was 86 by 60 and heart rate was 94 beats per minute. ECG was normal. On, ocul on ocular examination, the vision was uh, 6 by 18 in the right eye and low light perception in left eye. On pinhole and, BC, pinhole and BCVA, the vision didn't improve. Extraocular movements were full and free and painless in all gauges. Head posture were central. Lead and anexa were within normal limits. On anterior segment examination, conjunctiva and corneal were normal. Anterior chamber shows normal depth in both eyes. Iris had normal pattern. In pupil examination, the RAPT was found in left eye. The lens was clear and IOP with applomation tonometer were within normal limits. On fundus examination, media were clear. Optic disc shows hyperemic swollen discs in both eyes. Cup disc ratio and neuroretinal rim was not appreciated in both eyes. Macula were normal and foveal reflexes were present. On general fundus, tortuous swollen retinal veins and narrow arteries were found in right eye. Dilated and tortuous vein with flame-shaped hemorrhages are found in left eye. Automated perimetry revealed a superior altitudinal defect in the right eye and there were no any signs of giant cell arthritis. Lab results showed severe anemia with hemoglobin level of 4.8 and low mean corpuscular volume, an iron level of 11 and a ferritin level of 9 microgram per liter. Both CRP and ESR were within normal range. GGT was elevated, a vitamin B12 deficiency was ruled out, folate was also in within normal range. CT of brain showed no space occupying lesion, significant stenosis or recent infarction. CT of abdomen showed no any abnormality. Both gastroscopy and colonoscopy were normal. Severe anemia resulting from a gastric ulcer causing bilateral optic swelling with possible hypoperfusion and NAION was returned as working diagnosis. Following blood transfusion, hemoglobin increased to 8.1 mg per deciliter. Optic swelling waned, vision in the right eye improved but didn't recover in the left eye. The picture one showed the fundus picture of the right eye showing clear media with hyperemic swollen disc tortuous swollen retinal vein and narrow arteries. The left eye uh, fundus picture shows optic disc swelling, dilated and tortuous veins along with flame-shaped hemorrhages. The automated perimetry of the right eye shows superior altitudinal defect. On discussion, the present case shares both features of NAION and anemic retinopathy. Both papilledema due to intracranial hypertension and NAION may result from anemia. Anemia increases erythropoietin levels which trigger thrombocytopoiesis. As a result, thrombocytosis increases viscosity and clot formation. 
Macrocytic anemia due to iron deficiency may also increase viscosity with reduced cell deformity due to inhibition of thrombophoresis by iron. Hyperviscosity may subsequently increase venous pressure, which then decreases CSF resorption and increases intracranial pressure. Treatment of anemia in itself may improve optic disc swelling and vision, suggesting a direct association between optic disc swelling and anemia. In the case presented, correction of anemia improved vision in the right eye drastically in the short term. Since such improvement is less likely to occur in NAI1, anemia seems to play a pivotal role in the present case. The pathogenesis of NAI1 may encompass hyperperfusion of the optic nerve head and more rarely an empolic lesion. Palatal NAI1 is most often reported after hypotension and or anemia following dialysis and surgery. Limitation in the present case that since the patient was hemodynamically unstable, a lumbar tap and magnetic resonance venography were impossible to perform in order to objectify possible intracranial hypertension and exclude cerebral venous sinus thrombosis respectively. Both would have been uh, helpful. In, at, in conclusion, both papilledema and NAI may be associated with anemia and always need to be included in differential diagnosis of patient presenting with bilateral optic disc swelling and painless loss of vision. Routine workup should include a CBC, serum iron, and vitamin B12. If anemia is present, prompt correction is crucial as it may limit optic nerve damage and enhance the visual outcome. These are my references. Thank you. You have mentioned the patient has no, uh, I mean, visual status is no PL yes, in left eye. Yes, ma'am. Uh, what is the role of uh, uh, pinhole uh, testing after uh, no PL vision? Sorry, ma'am? You have mentioned this the patient's vision in left eye is no, no, PL. no PL. And after that is a, you tried to improve the vision with pinhole. I mean, what is the role of pinhole in case of uh, no PL vision? No, ma'am. Uh, the patient already had symptoms in the fellow Y2. That's why we are uh, uh, checking the pinhole. Yeah, but it should be, uh, I mean, after pinhole, um, uh, I mean, you have mentioned is a no PL. Then what is the role of pinhole? I mean, there is no role in uh, if patient has PL negative. So your working diagnosis was NAI1, but yes. no PL, like, so it is uh, not uncommon that the patient started uh, complaining if uh, when both eyes are in involved. It in, in my cases, it is possible that uh, the patient had sequential ner optic nerve involvement uh, initially, which is unrejected, but it, he start complaining when second eye was involved. I feel needs a little bit of further investigations regarding you know, imaging and all. So has this case report been published already? No, ma'am. Okay. Any similar studies? Any similar reports? No, sir. I didn't found any similar cases in India. There are many. There are a few. Mm. I think you have to search. You can check when you go. Okay. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Take, take, take. Take, take. Good morning, everyone. Myself, Dr. Devika Bhattacharya. I will be presenting a case report on positive visual phenomena in the prion disease, a diagnostic dilemma. Coming to the introduction, positive visual phenomena refers to seeing extra details which are not usually present in the visual system. These visual phenomena can mask severely even potentially fatal systemic health diseases. Diseases like migraine, Charles Bonnet syndrome, brain tumors, metabolic disorders can cause these phenomena. This is a typical phantom image uh, uh, showing of uh, Charles Bonnet syndrome. This is a scintillating scrotum of migraine. This is a self-portrait chimera shown in the patients with brain tumor. I had a different presentation than that. What I have given in the hall is different. We present a case. Uh, excuse me, sir. Sir, uh, sir, I had a little different presentation than this, sir. Sir, can we start that, sir, please? So 
If it's taking time, we can have the other presenter. Meanwhile, will, will it take time? Yes. A topic on to determine the risk factors and visual outcomes of non-arthritic anterior ischemic optic neuropathy in patients below the age of 50 years. <coughs> uh, Non-arthritic anterior ischemic optic neuropathy is characterized by acute painless and usually monoocular optic disc edema with uh, visual impairment. It is most commonly seen in patients uh, above the age of 50 years, and it is the second most common cause of optic, uh, permanent optic nerve-related visual loss after glaucoma. So a mechanism of NAION is hypo or non-perfusion of the optic nerve head and structurally small optic disc. So risk factors of NAION include uh, disc cartridge, uh, older age, vascular diseases like hypertension, diabetes, obstructive sleep apnea, blood loss due to uh, many surgeries, various medications like, and other ocular surgeries. So uh, occasionally NAION also occurs in patients younger than 50 years of age. So in our studies, uh, we are assessing the patients below the age of 50 years because these are often misdiagnosed as optic neuritis and papillitis leading to inappropriate workup and management. <coughs> in our study, we have evaluated the ophthalmic and systemic risk factors and visual outcomes of patients diagnosed with NAION. So this is a retrospective analytical study performed at Arvindai Hospital, Tirunelveli, and the data uh, collected from 2022 to 23. 30 patients with recent onset of NAION were included in this study. Uh, inclusion criteria for the study was patients below the age of 50 years and patients presenting within two weeks of uh, onset of symptoms, that is sudden painless uh, loss of vision, RAPD, swollen optic disc, with or without hemorrhages, and of course patient giving consent for study. Uh, exclusion criteria were giant cell arteritis, perioperative ischemic optic neuropathy, patients with severe NPDR, PDR, DME, and no follow-ups. So data collection was a uh, demographic information of the patient was collected, medical history, medication use, uh, symptom course, paraclinical evaluation, neuroimaging, and visual outcome. So results were 30 patients with recent onset of NAIN were included, and mean age was 45.8 years, which ranged from 21 to 50 years. Uh, fe uh, females were 13 and males were 17 in number. So in our studies, we found that uh, diabetes mellitus played a major risk factor, which was present in 70% of patients, followed by small CDR ratio and uh, hypertension. So uh, in most of these patients uh, who presented uh, below the age of 50 years, visual improvement was good. <coughs> Visual field defect uh, uh, was present only in 47% uh, of the patients and the most common defect was inferior altitudinal defect. So results were the most prevalent risk factor for NAI in, uh, in our patients was uh, diabetes mellitus, 70% followed by small CDR, 56.6% and which was followed by hypertension, 50%. Visual recovery was good in these patients and logmar visual acuity was uh, 0 0.42. Uh, discussion. So similar study which was uh, done by Bhevelani et al. It was risk factors and visual outcomes of non-arthritic anterior optic neuropathy in a tertiary center in Kuwait. Uh, this was also a retrospective study. The study duration was from 2006 to 2019. So in there uh, the most prevalent risk factor in young patients was small CDR ratio 68.7 percent followed by smoking and diabetes. And in, the, uh, in their study also, patients below the age of 50 years had better visual outcome. And in their study, the older age group, uh, diabetes was the uh, major risk factor followed by hypertension. In another study uh, presented by Turkoglu et al, that is a uh, captioned non-arteritic anterior ischemic optic neuropathy in young patients. 
This was also a retrospective comparative study and review of medical reports of 120 patients uh, was done. So diabetes was present in 63.6% .6 of uh, young patients. That was diabetes mellitus was the most important cause uh, in younger age groups. And uh, uh, hypertension uh, was associated in the older uh, age groups. And there was no difference in the visual outcome of these patients. So conclusion. Patients having systemic uh, vascular diseases and small cup to disc ratios, they have increased risk for developing NAIN in uh, age younger than 50 years. And awa awareness about these preventable risk factors like diabetes and hypertension may help to reduce the incidence of NAIN in uh, these patients. Thank you for patience hearing. Why are all patients, I mean, uh, how many you have the visual field effect? 46%, right? Uh, yes, ma'am. 47% it was present. Yeah. How many is the disc change of that? Sorry? Disc change? Any disc change you have noticed? Disc changes. Ma'am, small, uh, uh, small CDR ratio was present in most of the patients. And in uh, visual fields, inferior altitudinal defect was seen in these patients. Yeah, so why do you think, I mean, uh, you have only 46% uh, altitudinal defect? You have altitudinal defect, right? Inferior altitudinal yes, defect. Yes, ma yes, ma'am. Uh, uh, yes, ma'am. Can only you explain? Uh, that is only what we found in our study that um, visual defect, uh, like compared to other studies, uh, visual defect was present in uh, less patients in our case, in our study. Thank you. I will be presenting. Hello. Uh, am I audible? Yeah. Uh, good morning, everyone. I am Dr. Devika Bhattacharya. I will be presenting a case report on positive visual phenomena in the prion disease, a diagnostic dilemma. If it is not working. Coming to the introduction, positive visual phenomena refers to seeing extra details which are not usually present in the visual system. These visual phenomena can mask severely even potentially fatal systemic health issues. Diseases like migraine, Charles Bonnet syndrome, brain tumors, metabolic disorders, drug intoxication, and infection of brain with prion can cause these phenomena. This is a typical phantom image seen in Charles Bonnet syndrome. This is a scintillating scotoma of migraine. This is a self-portrait chimera, which is seen in patients of brain tumor. This is a visually disturbing phenomena, which is seen in uh, patients with CJ disease. We present a case report of a young, of a 62 years female, a farmer by occupation. Her chief complaint was green colored vision in both eyes for past one week. She was also optically hallucinating with insects with uh, hair like strands disturbing her vision. This lady was referred to us as malingering, so we performed a detailed examination. Her systemic examination history was normal. She did not have any uh, history of uh, trauma or surgery. Uh, her uh, family history was normal, and uh, she was a vegetarian by diet. Anterior segment shows a uh, cortical cataract with normally uh, briskly reacting uh, pupil. Fundus examination was normal. We coming to the investigations, we performed NCT was normal, color vision and central fields were abnormal, OCT was WNL, and her vision was improving to 6 by 9. She was conscious but not oriented. She had subacute confusion when patient was being examined. Uh, on the basis of the Crucifield Jacob disease neurological scale, our patient presented with 11 out of 33 positive criteria, uh, which was given by WHO. The deep tendon reflexes were normal. Uh, in the video one, you can see that patient is having gait ataxia. She is not able to walk properly when he, her eyes are closed. In the second video, you will be able to see that patient is not able to follow the commands during tone testing. And later, she was able to walk on the straight line when her eyes was open. Coming to the next videos, and uh, the first video, patient was able to follow the commands when she was showed, her, showed the actions, but she was not able to perform and initiate by herself. 
Her second video showed proprioception was intact, but there was no was loss of dexterity, and she was confused but not oriented to time, place, and person. Seeing this, we performed malingering test in which her room with obstacle test it was normal, signature minutes test everything was normal, her finger to nose test was also normal. Only if she had briskly reacting pupil with head rotation test normal. We performed other investigations, thinking it as a cortical insults, so where uh, serum electrolytes were normal, VEP was normal with latency and amplitude. Uh, EEG showed tri periodic shaft wave complexes and diffusion weighted MRI showed cortical ribboning. She had bilateral occipitoparietal cortical ribboning suggestive of Creutzfeldt's disease. This was cortical ribboning. So seeing this atypical presentation, we had uh, Kuru, our differential diagnosis we made was Grassmann Strossler Schenker's disease, Bovine spongifive encephalopathy, Huntington disease, mad cow disease and Alzheimer's disease. So since there was no family history and the patient was a vegetarian, a diagnosis of sporadic CJD, a rare Heidenhain variant was formed. This patient was referred to Nimhans for further management and end-of-life care support. This devastating diagnosis painted a grim prognosis with rapid progression and a fatal trajectory within six months. Coming to the discussion, CJ disease was first diagnosed by in 1996. It is a rapid, it is a rare neurodegenerative disease with a rapid progression and high mortality rate suspected to be contracted by eating uh, infected cows. Patient is a patient will be in old age and it will cause accumulation of prion proteins in the brain causing loss of neurons. Prion diseases are proteinaceous and infective particles. These are not degraded by typical sterilization. They have highest criteria in, criteria in brain and they have a long incubation time. Diagnosis is mainly clinical, complex, and requires a combination of clinical findings, EEG and MRI. There are four subtypes of CJD, sporadic, familial, iatogenic, and variant. Disease course is the rapid cognitive decline, inability to perform daily routine or tasks. Dementia will be a classic hallmark and visual symptoms can be Harbergov disease. This is a proposed algorithm of disease and management of Scrooge Jacobs disease. Uh, coming to prevention and treatment, there is no known uh, no treatment, worsen rapidly. A patient uh, medication will be given for spasm and agitation. Diagnosis is easily contacted by procedures in vitro retina surgery. EEG, ERG testing it can be done before any visual symptoms, and it has a possible co a possibility of malignant. So take-home points will be: it is a major health concern. Positive visual phenomena should be picked up early in the OPD and CJD, even before the patient becomes aware of their symptoms, they die rapidly. These are my references. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you, uh, thank you that you uh, had done all those malignant tests in that yes, patient. And uh, you should always keep the other uh, diagnosis in mind because cortical ribboning is seen in other diseases also and should know the other features of MRI or CJD. Yes, sir. Thank you. Thank you so much, ma'am. Thank you. So I thank, I thank everyone for uh, their presentations. Thank you very much. Sorry for the delay. We had a power outage in the middle, so.